All right, once again, the Evergreen Building at the College of Southern Idaho in Twin Falls, Idaho, uh, in my classroom, uh, room A06, a little messy, apologize. Um, but we're gonna, this is one last video we're gonna do on minerals. I thought about moving right into rocks and I thought it might be fun to just do a small collection of metallic minerals. Um, ones that you might already know, I'm sure you've heard of most of them, um, but maybe provide a little bit of in insight and give you some extra information or some fun facts that maybe you didn't know about these minerals. And then what we'll do next is we'll, we'll switch gears and move into rocks. Um, probably starting with like just something basic like how the three major types of rocks igneous sedimentary metamorphic and how you can tell one apart from the other because i think that's a great place to start if you're out looking at your own samples and on your own adventures it's just like okay i've got a rock here and it's got lines going through it what kind of rock might it be um so we'll do that uh next time and that'll be a new series um that will that will launch uh, in the next couple weeks so uh today we're going to focus on um Metallic minerals. So I've picked four metallic minerals um, that are pretty common, um, but you just don't seem to find, for the most part, unless you're maybe rooting around old mine dumps or places where they prospected for these minerals, I doubt you're just going to be wandering around on a hike and just see a big chunk of one of these uh, just sitting right next to the trail. But you never know. So these are fun anyway. They are common in the world of, of minerals, but not nearly as common as the minerals we've discussed so far, what we call sort of the rock forming minerals. But nonetheless, uh, we're going to start with hematite. Uh, hematite really is the same thing as rust. So when iron oxidizes, here's our chemical formula, it forms a mineral. You call it in the common world and just the, the regular world rust, but in the mineral world, this is actually a mineral called hematite. We're going to see that hematite is kind of a weird mineral. It has a couple different appearances it can show. Um, the color and the luster vary. Sometimes it's metallic in luster and sometimes it's non-metallic. Basically it depends on how much oxidation has occurred in the material. Uh, the color varies somewhat from kind of reddish, reddish brown to actually kind of silvery gray and I'll show you a sample that kind of shows that. What's the big giveaway with hematite is it'll always yield a reddish streak. And so even in a silvery gray sample, um, if you get a kind of reddish brown or reddish streak, um, that's gonna be a big giveaway that you've got hematite. Um, it's non-magnetic, although sometimes because it has a close affinity uh, with magnetite, it gets mixed in with it. And so you, it might, your sample might have some magnetism if it's mixed a little bit in uh, with the magnetite. Uh, it's kind of a weird mineral in that it varies a little bit in its hardness. I'm not sure exactly what controls that. Um, I'd have to dig into that a little bit more. But it, it's either kind of right at where glass is, you know, five and a half. So it might be scratching the glass, but just barely. Or it might be uh, very, uh, you know, uh, solidly scratching the glass, maybe six and a half. And then uh, hematite has a cool uh, sort of, uh, I guess, you know, uh, ancient human uh, tie-in, and that is um, the red powdery version of it, sometimes called ochre, and this was used as a pigment, basically a paint. Uh, people wrote on parchments with it, they wrote on walls, like rock walls with it, with uh, pictographs. Uh, they probably painted pottery with it, I believe, um, maybe put paint on their bodies, whatever. So anyway, this this is a, a pigment that can be used uh, for different types of paints. Um, we're gonna see when we look at it in rocks, um, usually it's an alteration product. So usually if iron in a rock gets oxidized, um, you'll get hematite. It can form a coating, like a weathered coating on the outer surface of a rock. When it weathers down uh, greatly, especially in more tropical climates, it can turn, uh, so it'll make very red soils, very tropical soils like laterites if you're into soil science. Um, it's a really common cement in sedimentary rocks. It's actually, what gives some of those beautiful red rocks in southern Utah and the Colorado Plateau, their, their beautiful kind of reddish or kind of orange, uh, pink, different red hues uh, look is, um, is actually the hematite. So it's actually the cement between the little grains of usually quartz. Uh, and then it's also in um, this unique thing called a banded iron formation, uh, which I'll have to dig out because I just realized I, I didn't pull that out yet. So I'll have to show that uh, as well. So. Uh, so let's look at hematite. Um, so here are some samples. Let me set up the tripod again. Seems to work pretty well. 
some samples of hematite. So here's uh, one that's very different. You know, most hematite probably is one of these kind of reddish, kind of orange looking uh, samples here. This one has a, a unique kind of texture with these little bumps on it. This is called botryoidal texture, just these little kind of balls, almost looks, I guess, like cauliflower. And you can see again that this mineral just varies quite a bit from being obviously non-metallic. It's kind of an earthy color. doesn't look anything like a metal, but then it does have some varieties like this where it's quite shiny. Um, and this is sometimes called specular hematite. Uh, but nonetheless, it's all the same mineral. Uh, and so if we take a, a street plate here and kind of drag it across and kind of let some of the pieces fall off, you can see kind of that reddish brown hue coming through, even though the sample itself uh, was this kind of silvery gray color. Of course, if we do the same with, with some of these other samples, this streak's gonna be uh, pretty obvious, very similar to the, the color of the mineral itself. Uh, so that's hematite, um, really common. I mean, just a weathering product on the surface of rocks. You, you often see it that way. Here it is in some, uh, some different sandstones. Uh, this is from uh, just west of Las Vegas, Red Rock uh, area. It's a climbing area, but also just a really scenic area. Not sure why there's green marker stripes on it. Don't know about that. Anyway, but the red blotches in here are just... Uh, areas where there's uh, oxidized iron or hematite that's forming. Uh, some other different colors in the sandstone, um, again, just all caused by hematite, which forms a really great cement in a lot of different rocks. Another kind of blotchy one there where there's just different areas of iron oxidation. And this is your classic, um, this is like Navajo sandstone um, that's often found in places like Zion National Park. Again, the red color in there is hematite. The quartz, the grains themselves are actually all quartz. And quartz, of, quartz, of course, uh, is a mineral we've looked at that doesn't really have much color. It's essentially colorless or white. And so the color imparted in the rock is mainly uh, the hematite cement there. Uh, so that's hematite. Uh, we'll spend a couple minutes now looking at magnetite, which is also an iron oxide, but a different uh, a form of iron, different charge. Uh, this is an iron ore, also like hematite. Uh, they're both uh, mined for their iron content. Uh, this usually is black to kind of dark gray. Uh, you, on a fresh surface, it'll have a metallic luster, so it will look like uh, metal. And then, of course, as the name implies, this is uh, one of our strongest magnetic minerals. So this will strongly attract a magnet. And this material itself um, can sometimes be magnetized and then it's sometimes called lodestone so the mineral itself is magnetic but it actually can also act as a magnet and i'm not sure i understand the physics of that someone smarter than me might chime in uh, and usually it's yeah harder harder than glass um, when we look at magnetite um, we find this a lot in um, people who go panning for gold know about magnetite because it's a common in black sands it's kind of a heavy sand that will settle out and uh, be concentrated with your gold because it's a heavier material. Uh, it's useful in geology because it preserves paleomagnetism. So little bits of magnetite are in uh, essentially all, all rocks, but especially in our igneous rocks, there's, there's tiny amounts of it. And we can look at the orientation of those mag magnetite crystals to see what the Earth's magnetic field was, how it was oriented at uh, different points in time. And it's also in the banded iron formations as well. And this is a, a kind of alternating hematite, uh, magnetite uh, bed of rock that is common uh, in the upper Midwest. Uh, just a couple pieces of magnetite. They, all the samples I have pretty much all uh, look the same. So there's not a ton of variation here. Um, but you can see, you know, dark, silvery. It is a little bit heavy uh, in terms of its weight. Uh, but you can see the metallic luster coming through in places um, where it's kind of fresh, that kind of silvery look to it. Uh, same sort of thing here. Um, and then again, the cool thing is it's magnetic, right? So it will attract the magnet. Um, and everyone loves magnets, right? This is just fun for people of all ages. I've given magnets to three-year-olds and they're entertained. I've given magnets to 80-year-olds and they're entertained. So everyone loves a good magnet. And a magnetic mineral is a pretty cool uh, pretty cool thing. So, so there's magnetite. And then now we're going to look at a couple of sulfides. So rather than having oxygen, they have some sort of metal and then sulfur. So we'll look at galena, which is a lead sulfide. So this is mined for lead. This is um, 
This is why your car battery is so heavy, is it contains lead, um, and galena is one of the minerals we, we mine to extract that lead. Uh, it's usually this really obvious silvery gray color. It's metallic when it's fresh, and it's like I said, it's incredibly heavy. It has a high specific gravity. It's a dense mineral. If someone hands you a chunk of galena or a rock that has appreciable amounts of galena in it, just by the feel of the rock itself, you'll probably get a sense that it, it could be uh, the galena that's in there. Uh, real characteristic three cleavage planes at 90 degrees, so it makes cubes. It's actually softer than glass, so it has a hardness much softer than glass. So galena, even though it looks, it's heavy and it's metallic looking and it looks pretty tough, it's actually a fairly soft mineral, especially in the world of metallic minerals. Um, and there is some galena that does contain um, silver in it. So this is actually not just a lead ore, but in the right situations, it can also be a lead, an ore of silver, where it's called argentiferous galena. Argent, this is just, uh, uh, basically means it's, it's silver in galena, because silver actually can substitute in for the lead in, in some situations, at least partially some of those lead uh, ions. And so you can find uh, some silver in galena. Um, in terms of rocks, we mainly just see it in anytime you get a rock that's had hot fluids moving through it, what we call hydrothermal veins, um, you can concentrate galena along with a host of other uh, metals and metallic minerals. Um, and we also sometimes see it in limestones where we get these lead zinc deposits, usually again, fluids that have moved through the limestone and concentrated these metals. I did not have a limestone sample with some galena in it, um, but I've got some nice, just sort of regular samples of galena here, uh, starting with my big, big, awesome cube that everyone seems to like. Uh, I haven't weighed this. I should probably weigh this, but this is maybe about four, four or five inches across by four or five inches each direction. But you can see the characteristic kind of cube shape, those beautiful cleavage planes reflecting the light, three cleavage planes, 90 degrees, uh, big chunk there. Here's another really cool sample. This one actually has a little bit of pyrite in it as well. So another sulfide, these hang out together. Lead sulfide is the galena, iron sulfide is the pyrite. So this one kind of has like several cubes kind of all squished together. Um, so those are kind of like the really sweet samples, but I also wanted to show you just maybe some less exciting ones. But here's, this is actually galena. It doesn't have the characteristic cube shape, but if you look closely inside it, or you look at it with a hand lens, you can see those that cubic cleavage. You can see that it's breaking along those three cleavage planes. It's just that in this case, is the overall shape of this sample um, doesn't scream out that cubic shape. But again, kind of heavy to the touch. Uh, here's kind of a sweet little sample with quartz crystals um, growing on top of the galena. So these sometimes often are found together, especially again in, in hydrothermal situations where you've got um, fluids moving through rocks and precipitating different types of material. And then this was the best one I had in terms of just like, you know, like here's, here's what it looked like on the outside, uh, but when broken open, uh, you can see some of the galena. And this again is pretty heavy to the touch. And so this just is sort of a, I guess it's just a tarnished weathered got some weathering coating because it's pretty much pure galena on the inside. So, so that's galena. Uh, our last one here with our fun little lesson today is pyrite, fool's gold. You've probably all heard of this. Um, it's a little redundant and it bugs me a little bit when people say iron pyrite because pyrite by definition contains iron. So saying iron pyrite is, is kind of redundant. It's like saying, you know, the, the paper's whitish white or something like that. Uh, you don't need to say iron in front of pyrite. It's just pyrite. So this is a ore of sulfur, um, which is used for lots of different things. Back in the old days, uh, pyrite was used because it uh, would generate a spark. And so it was used to uh, just for like uh, different, maybe making fires or something like that. Um, brassy yellow color, metallic luster, makes cubic crystals, harder than glass, and it's very brittle. Um, so it's um, one way you can tell fool's gold or pyrite apart from regular gold is True gold is malleable. That's why you sometimes see the old timers put it in their teeth and kind of bite down on it. Um, not a good idea to do, it's kind of brutal on your teeth. <clears throat> but pyrite, um, first of all, pyrite's harder than glass. So I don't encourage people putting pyrite in their mouth. But the point is gold is somewhat soft and you can, you can push on it and it will deform a little bit. Um, and it also doesn't have the, the cubic shape as well. So gold does not have that kind of shape to it. Um, similar uh, situation to the galena where hydrothermal veins 
Also contact metamorphism, which is basically when we have magma intruding rocks, cooling and or, uh, causing chemical reactions between the rocks they intrude and the magma, and you can concentrate pyrite. It's a really good indicator. I mean, if you're hiking somewhere and you see pyrite in the rocks, uh, from an economic point of view, there could be some value in those rocks because pyrite's typically a good indicator of other metals existing as well. And sometimes, I wish I had a sample of this and I thought I did, but I, I hunted for it in my messy closet and I didn't see it. But sometimes it replaces fossil material. So there's actually, you can get online and look at really cool examples of like different shells um, or bones perhaps that have been replaced by pyrite. So pyrite fossils, uh, kind of a cool thing there. Uh, and just a couple of fun samples here to wrap up. So here is um, a nice cube. So pyrite cubic crystal. You can see again the, the three, three faces there. And um, a lot of times it also looks kind of like this, like little raspberries. Uh, I think these little shapes are called, when it's this, it's called luniform or something like that. These kind of like, uh, not quite cubic, but more like almost octahedral shapes in the pyrite. Uh, a lot of times you'll see it more like this, you know, it's very rare. You might get these nice big crystals forming. So you might just see it more as this kind of a goldish, more fine grained texture in there. Uh, and then one more sample here. Maybe there are all the ones I had were pretty nice samples. I didn't have any kind of I need obviously collect, try collecting to remember to collect some of these things in veins and other things when I'm kind of out and about. So uh, hopefully that was helpful. Um, some of the metallic minerals. Again, just wanted to maybe do one more la last video on the minerals. Um, something that might be helpful to you, something that might be fun just for metallic minerals, ones you probably heard of. Uh, again, we'll, we'll look at rocks next time. And so for now, we'll put a pin in our mineral video series, Minerals with Wilsey. Uh, I don't know what I'll call the next one. If you have a good suggestion for the rock series, go ahead and put it in the comments. Uh, remember, you can always help me out with support. There's a, a donate button on the banner of the YouTube page, and there's always um, a link in the description to PayPal and Venmo uh, if you wanna uh, throw something my way. So appreciate it, and we'll catch you guys next time.